So in this video, we're going to get into some calculator functions, uh, namely the normal CDF calculator function. We'll teach you what it is, what it does, uh, when to use it, how to use it, that kind of stuff. So hopefully at this point, you're fairly comfortable drawing the picture. So you've seen a variety of problems maybe um, where we're talking about something that's normally distributed, in this case, offensive tackles weights. All right. Um, so it has this shape right here. And maybe you're even comfortable understanding that the area underneath the curve, this shaded region, for example, between 280 and 320, has two different interpretations. You can either think of it as the probability, if you grab one of these offensive tackles at random, the probability that it'll weigh between 280 and 320 pounds. Or you can think about it as the percentage of all offensive tackles that weigh between 280 and 320 pounds. And so in this picture, what we're saying is that that answer to either of those two questions is 32%. And at this point, when we were just drawing the pictures, I didn't show you how to come up with this number, but we've learned how to come up with this number kind of, sort of, using this thing called the empirical rule. Uh, what you're gonna learn in this video is that empirical rule stuff, that stuff that often students struggle with and don't really like, wasn't really all that necessary or even useful. I mean, it was necessary in the sense that you have to learn it to pass an intro to statistics class. That's why I went over it. But what we're gonna see here is that everything the empirical rule can do for you, the normal CDF function can do for you. And the normal CDF function does it a lot more efficiently and precisely, which is gonna be kind of nice. You'll probably end up liking the normal CDF function a lot more than you like the empirical rule, so maybe that's good news. But I wanna be careful introducing the normal CDF function because the challenge here when we get into calculator functions, there's gonna be two of them. And this thing that students struggle with is confusing the two of them, using one when they're supposed to use the other. And that's why I've tried to be so careful about talking about what that area underneath the curve really represents, because understanding that is the key to understanding which calculator function you're going to use. All right, enough talking. Let me do a couple of examples for you. Uh, this first example, you've seen it before. Suppose the volume of a dog's bark is approximately normally distributed. All oh, right, so that means that I can draw this bell shape that I've drawn over and over again. It's a new day since I made those other videos, so I'm going a little slower, drawing a little bit more beautiful looking curves. Not to pat myself on the back too much. Uh, we got a mean here. It's a population mean. So you can use the symbol mu for it. And it's 80. And as you know, that 80 goes right in the middle of your distribution here. And you're also told the standard deviation, population standard deviation, sigma is the Greek letter symbol for that. And that's 10. And that tells you how much you should count up and down by. As you've seen, you're going to count up and down three times by whatever the standard deviation is to draw your picture. And then once you draw that picture, you try to figure something out. In this case, it says, what is the probability that? All right, so remember, what is the probability that if you grab one dog at random, its bark is between 60 and 90? That's one of the two interpretations of the area underneath the curve. That is asking me to figure out the area between 60 and 90 here. And if you have a good memory, you might be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you did that. You did that with the empirical rule. Remember, this was kind of a hard empirical rule example. We split this up into two different pieces. We split it at 80. We figured out the area from 60 to 80, <clears throat> 47 and a half, I think that ended up being. And then from 80 to 90, that area was, what, 34%. We added those up. Here, why don't I just show you? There's this example right here. This is, we did it a couple different ways. We got 81 and a half percent. Turns out that's a lie. Turns out it's not 81 and a half percent. It's close to 81.5%, but it's not exactly 81.5% because the empirical rule doesn't give you exact answers. It estimates. And the reason it estimates is because it doesn't want you to memorize 68.26893742 or something like that. It just has you memorize 68%, which isn't accurate. But your calculator can be accurate. Anyways, to answer this question, what you need to know is anytime you're trying to find the area, you're like, yeah, that's all I've done. Right, but I'm going to introduce new things where you're not just finding the area, but it's going to be very similar to that in the next video. And it'll be really confusing if I don't beat this to death. So please excuse me for beating this to death. Anytime you're trying to find the area underneath the curve, use the normal CDF function. Whoops. So to figure this out, I'm going to use the normal CDF function in my calculator. And I talked above a little bit, I didn't even read this to you, about where to find the normal CDF function in your calculator. I want to just show you right here. It's under the distribution menu, which kind of makes sense. All the calculator functions you're going to need are under this distribution menu because we're talking about the normal distribution. There's other distributions in here, but the normal distribution is one distribution your calculator knows about. 
Um, and of course, it's going to keep it on the distribution menu. That makes sense. To get in the distribution because it's above the variables key in blue here, I'm going to hit this blue key and then variables. So I hit a second and then variables, and that takes me into the distribution menu. And you'll see a lot of different functions here. The only two you'll be using in the, this series of videos are the second and the third one. Uh, but we'll get to the third one in the next video. In this video, the only one you're using is this one that says normal CDF. Word of caution, there's also one that says normal PDF. You'll never be using that in this class. Um, I can tell you what that means. It's kind of interesting, but since this is supposed to be the minimum you need for this class, I'm not going to waste your time on that. Normal CDF. Get in there. When you hit enter, one of two things will happen. If you have a user-friendly version, if you have the updated software on your calculator, it'll ask you for the lower bound, the upper bound, the center, and the spread. You'll have to type in all those numbers. So in this case, this area, its lower bound is 60. So I put in a 60 right here. And if you don't see this screen, don't worry. I'm going to show you what to do if you don't see that screen in just a minute. The upper bound on this area is this 90, right? The area goes from 60 to 90. The center is going to be mu uh, 80 over here. So I'll type in 80. And the spread will end up being sigma, which is 10. And you're like, why'd you call it center and spread when it says mu and sigma here? Because it's better to think about it as center and spread than mu and sigma. Because what you'll see later when we get into more complicated stuff is we don't always put mu and sigma here. We put in whatever the appropriate measures are of center and spread. They start out being mu and sigma, but later on they won't be mu and sigma. So I'm always going to say center and spread. And I'm going to make the point that at this point in the class, the center and the spread always are mu and sigma, as your calculator kind of implies. Anyways, you put those in, your calculator spits out this area for you. It'll be really close to 81.5%. Um, if you didn't see that screen, if you hit normal CDF and it just said on your screen, normal CDF, it's waiting for four arguments. And the arguments you have to give it are the same that I just gave. Lower bound, upper bound, center, and spread. And you have to put them in in that order. So lower bound first, and then a comma. There's a special key for the comma. And then upper bound, which was 90, comma, center, which was 80, comma, spread, which was 10. You put that all in and you hit enter, and it spits this out for you. Um, I like to actually type those in, or to kind of write those down. Your teacher might not care about that, but I kind of prefer students doing this. Because if you make a little typo or something, and you get the wrong answer, but you don't tell me where it comes from, how am I supposed to give you extra credit? But if you write all this down, and then you write the wrong answer, I can be like, all right, the student obviously knew what they were doing. Or if you write something similar to this, but you switch these two numbers up, I can give you a lot of the credit for it. Anyways, that ends up being zero point. I don't know, round of four decimal places, maybe 8186. In other words, roughly 81.86%. You want to format your answer as a decimal or as a percentage rounded to two decimal places. Note, it's not 81.5. Pretty damn close to 81.5, but it's not exactly 81.5. It's roughly 81.86. Uh, your calculator is a lot more precise than the empirical rule was. That's the normal CDF function. Anytime you want to find the area under the curve, you can use the normal CDF function. I'm going to do that a couple more times. And what you'll see is it's easier than the empirical rule. It's easier than the empirical rule because you don't have to be clever about it. You don't have to cut anything in half or add up different areas or subtract them. You just have to recognize the lower bound, the upper bound, the center, and the spread. Let's do another one. How likely is it that my dog's loudest bark, or that a dog's loudest bark, is between 101 and 105 decibels? A comment here. You couldn't even do this question with the empirical rule, right? The empirical rule only worked when these numbers were either one, two, or three standard deviations above or below the mean. 101 and 105 aren't. That's okay. Your calculator doesn't care about that. The normal CDF function in your calculator is a lot more, it's a lot more flexible than the empirical rule is. 90, 100, 110, 70, 60, and 50. I want to know the area between 101 and 105. So 101 is like right there. 105, maybe it's right there. But it's just a tiny little bit of area right here. I'm trying to figure out figure out this area right here. First, I guess I didn't do the kind of annoying thing that I always do that I probably should do. How likely is it that a dog's loudest bark is between here and here? I'm trying to figure out the probability that if I grab one dog at random, its loudest bark will be between 101 and 105. That's one of the two interpretations of the area under the curve. So recognize that this question is asking for the area under the curve. You're like, it's always asking me for the area under the curve. It is now, but it won't always be. Trust me.
Do normal CDF. Normal CDF always asks for four arguments. First, it always wants the lower bound, which is 101. Next, it always wants the upper bound, which is 105. Next, it always wants the center, which is mu, 80. And then it always wants the spread, which is sigma, 10. Type those into your calculator. Remember, normal CDF is under the distribution menu. It's the second one listed here. When you hit enter, I guess you end up hitting enter twice. It spits out the answer. Notice a really small answer. I expected it to be a small answer. There's not a whole lot of area there. Uh, it's about 1% of the total area under the curve. We got 0, 0.0, if I get around to four decimal places, that's not like some standard thing. I'm just picking a number, 117. Um, I kind of like formatting these as percentages, but you don't have to. 1.17% is how likely it is. That's it. I got two more examples uh, just to show you a couple special cases. What is the probability they randomly selected, selected dog's loudest bark is less than 98 decibels? You might notice that this one's a little bit different. The earlier problems always gave me a lower bound and an upper bound, which was important. I needed a lower bound and an upper bound because those are the first two arguments that I'm putting into normal CDF. In this case, it almost appears it doesn't give you, well, let me show you what to do. First, I'll draw the picture. I always start out by drawing the picture. Um, your teacher might not require it. I'm going to require it. Uh, it. Helps me give students partial credit. What is the probability randomly selected dog's bark is less than 98? 98 would be right here. Less than would be all these numbers. So I'm talking about this area over here. This is if I grab one dog at random, what is the probability that it falls in this range? That sounds like figure out this area right here. So you're trying to figure out this area. You recognize to figure out the area under curve, you use normal CDF. The problem with normal CDF is it needs a lower bound. There is no lower bound. I want everything less than 98. You might think, oh, just go from zero to 98. First off, you might think to go to 50 to 98. Definitely don't do that. This is not the bottom of your distribution. There's more stuff to the left here. So how far to the left do you go? <clears throat> In this case, it'd be fine to go from zero to 98. You get the same answer. But to be safe, what I'm gonna tell you to do is anytime you don't have a lower bound, like in this picture right here, put in a large negative number. That might be a little bit of overkill. It definitely is in this problem, but depending on the distribution you have, you might have negative numbers that are relevant. You always put in a large negative number. A negative E99 is scientific notation. Maybe an easier way to do that is just negative, some large number. 9999 is plenty large. All the way up to 98. My center is still 80. My spread is still 10. I'm missing a lower bound, so just trick your calculator. Put in some really, really large negative number, something way out here, so that it acts as though there's no lower bound. Go into the distribution menu, <clears throat> normal CDF. Oh, here's something to be careful of. This is the subtraction sign. Don't use the subtraction sign. You're not trying to subtract 9999. You want negative. That's this key right here. Some of your calculators will be fine if you use the subtraction key instead of the negative key, but some won't. Some will give you an error if you do that. So use the negative key down here. Up to 98, my center is 80, my spread is 10. Either you type it into that user-friendly window or you type them in to this screen with commas in between all of them. Either way is totally fine. You hit enter, it should spit out this number for you. 0 0.9641 if I round it to four decimal places. It answers that question. So the reason I wanted to do this example was to show you what you do if you're missing a lower bound. Uh, this question, what percentage of dogs bark louder than 85 decibels? Again, what percentage of all dogs, that's the area underneath the curve, louder than 85 decibels? Fine, I know 80 is in the middle. I'm counting up and down by 10, so there's 90, 100, 110, 70, 60, 50. So if this is 90, 85 would be somewhere in here. You might want to label all those points. It's probably not a bad idea. But in the interest of trying to make this video a little shorter, I'm going to leave it like that. I got here. Note that this time I do have a lower bound. It's 85. So normal CDF, because I want to find the area underneath the curve. My lower, lower bound is 85. But I don't have an upper bound. Here, when I was missing a lower bound, I put in a large negative number in its place. 
Here I'm missing an upper bound, so what I'm going to do? Put a large positive number. Any large positive number you want. 9999 is plenty large enough. All right, no dogs barking louder than 9,999 decibels. Although by that logic, you might think that zero would have made more sense here. No dogs barking quieter than zero decibels. Don't think too hard about these. If you're missing a lower bound, put in a large negative number. If you're missing an upper bound, put in a large positive number. And I don't care which one you do. Normal CDF. Lower bound is 85. Upper bound, any large positive number will do. It doesn't matter what. Oh, you put in five nines here and there's only four here. It doesn't matter. Makes no difference at all. Spit that out. It gives you this answer. 0 0.3085. In other words, 30.85%. That's how you use the normal CDF function in your calculator. What's the minimum you need to know? Well, it's a function in your calculator. Uh, for most of you, if you have a calculator like I have, it's under the distribution menu, which again, you hit get by hitting the second key and then variables. All right, this second key and then variables. And that's how you find normal CDF. Always give it four arguments. The upper bound, sorry. Oh, this is terrible. The lower bound, the upper bound. I'm going to have to fix this. You always give it four arguments. The lower bound, then the upper bound, then the center, then the spread. And if you have the user-friendly version like I have, it asks you for lower and upper. But if you don't, you have to know that order. So lower bound first, upper bound second, then center, then spread. And in this section, the center will always be mu and the spread will always be sigma. But what you'll see is that doesn't always happen. That's only in this section. Later on, when you get into the sampling distribution, and you'll know when you're there, your spread changes, for example. The normal CDF function always tells you the area under the curve that you bound it. And you might think, yeah, that's the only thing I've ever figured out, so what else could it possibly tell me? I'm going to show you in the next video something else that you're interested in figuring out, which is not that, but you'll confuse with that. Which is why I'm beating this idea to death, that the area under the curve means one of two things. It means the probability that if you grab one dog at random, it'll bark between whatever and whatever decibels. And it's the proportion of all dogs that bark between that many decibels. And then two little minor things, if no lower bound is given, if I ask, what's the probability that you bark less than 75 decibels? You don't have a lower bound. Use a large negative number. It doesn't matter which one you use. This is scientific notation. If no upper bound is given, like we had here, probability the dog barks louder than 85 decibels. Just put in a large positive number. That's it. That's everything I got on the normal CDF function.